All right, some news about the CBA. Let's talk about this, Brad. Um, it was announced that the NHL, uh, not the Players Association, but the league, uh, the deadline passed where there was essentially a clause for them to open up the CBA to expire after um, this next season. So a very quick summary. This is like a pretty big um, generalization or uh, simplification, but just to give you guys a background on it. Um, actually, let me pull up a tweet here that I made so that way that way people went or have an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, the current collective bargaining agreement between the league and the players association uh, expires in 2021 after the 2021, 2022 season. However, either party, the league or the players association um, has, or had now uh, the opportunity to trigger a clause that would have it expire in September of 2020, um, which would mean after this next season. So that, tr- that clause came up first for the NHL just this past week. The NHL basically signaled that the talks were going well. They felt like there was a lot of positive momentum. And, you know, to take it with a grain of salt, they were probably putting a lot of pressure on the Players Association. Uh, this is an optics move as well. Um, they kind of bought into all of those things, projected all those things, and let the deadline pass without triggering that clause. So as of now, it's completely on the Players Association. Their deadline is uh, in a couple weeks. Although it's pretty fluid, they can agree to move that deadline if they feel the need to, um, as long as both sides agree. Uh, the Players Association has the same option. If they say that they're not going to exercise that deadline, then the uh, they have essentially an extra year of the CBA to be negotiating. Um, and then more, it's it's much less likely that there's going to be a lockout. I thought it was two years. Two years. Yeah. Two years extended. Yes, because it's uh, it would it would end after the 2021-2022 season. So yeah, two years. All those lockout proof contracts that were signed imagine it gets delayed two years and all those guys get screwed yeah those owners who are sitting there like uh they don't have to pay out salary all year it's just big chunks at the beginning because of those signing bonuses of like oh well a lot of front costs but other than that um that's huge okay simplest thing here that's huge for hockey because lockouts suck i have a lot of praise for what Bettman has done for this league but one of the biggest and most valid gripes against him is that pretty much every collective bargaining agreement negotiation in the modern era or the modern eras has resulted in missed hockey. Every every single CBA negotiation and um, under Bettman has gone to lockout. Yep. Everyone without fail. Now, the flip side of that is I think the league is much better for the resulting CBAs. Not the lockouts. I think missed hockey sucks no matter what period, end of statement. But the CBA that resulted improved the game, improved the business, expanded the league, et cetera, et cetera. I think all of that is excellent. Um, it's still not great. And there's hope that this time that they're going to avoid that. The stakes aren't as high, right? Like the current disparity between the league's earnings and the players earning aren't as significant as they were before. It's called the 50, 50 split for anyone who wants to read more into escrow and everything. There's a lot of articles out there that can explain it because escrow is the big sticking point right now. Yes. Uh, And we'll, we'll, we'll summarize that in a second, but after you consider escrow fees, everything like that, the players essentially, they don't really get 50%. They come out probably 45, 46%. And escrow is a big sticking point. What escrow is, is essentially a certain amount of a player's salary is withheld arbitrarily um, to offset the need to basically balance how much the league gets in case they underperform. So there's an agreement that the owners get 50% of the cut every, every year of whatever hockey revenue is to make sure that um, players don't end up with a much bigger than 50% of the pie. If the league underperforms and teams don't earn as much as they're projected to, they withhold part of the player's salaries and then they use it to balance in case the league underperforms, they get it refunded to them eventually if it, if that ends up not being needed to kind of balance the scales, but the refund comes much later, oftentimes they get like pennies on the dollar or, you know, uh, only a certain percentage of what they lost back. And the general concept of money now is worth more than money later by not having that money, you're losing the opportunity to invest it, buy things you want with it, et cetera, et cetera. It's all basic econ. Um, basically players, their dream is to do away with escrow, but that, is a big ask. I think they want to control escrow more than anything. That's a realistic option here. It's all very boring, but it's very valid. Other big points, um, the Olympics, Olympics, which is what I'm the point I'm most curious about as to whether or not the players 
will reopen or not. Because if they don't, the next Olympics fall under this CBA, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. 2022. No. Yeah. Uh, 21. Yeah. 2021, 2022. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's February of 2022. So that will be an issue because there'll probably have to be a wink, wink, nudge, nudge deal then, whichever way that's going to go. Um, and yeah, the escrow thing, it doesn't, now we talk, we make the escrow thing sound like a massive deal to the players. It's a big deal, but it's not like a, it's not what it was before in previous lockouts. No, 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 no. This is the least amount of friction we've seen going into CBA negotiations. So we're hoping that it ends up being positive and resolved. Um, I honestly don't know if I hope they open it or not. Obviously part of me is wants to just extend this two years and go buy it. But part of me also wants to get the suffering out of the way. So, it, but the, the NHL is at a point right now where they're growing like they never have before. They can't afford to miss time under any circumstance. They cannot afford to miss time, especially like we're talking about the Olympics in China coming up huge opportunity there. Seattle coming in shortly. Cause if they extend it by two years, Seattle will be involved. Then yeah. if I'm the players, here's, here's the reason I would consider Keeping it open for two more years. Yeah. Money. It's the, it's the blatantly simple answer. But if you extend it by the two years, so three years from now is when you're getting the new CBA. Gambling money, Seattle money, new TV deal is all involved then. That's yeah. all on the table. You have hard numbers. You know what you're playing with, whereas right now you're projecting. Yeah. New TV deal is actually huge. Like, we're not going to talk about a rise in the cap like you saw in the NBA, but... Um, I, we had a Patreon comment a while back that actually kind of outlined a really good detail of all of that. The NHL has a very unique opportunity to capitalize on diversifying their TV deal, bringing mm-hmm. in money from different sources. And really, anytime there's a new deal, you're adjusting for what, you know, any market growth that you've had. The NHL mm-hmm. is bigger now than when they signed their last deal. They're going to get more money. The Seattle thing that you brought up is huge. You're and- going to bring a team into the league. You want to give them every single chance to be successful. And how are you going to tell those hockey fans, oh, you're please pay to see this NHL team. By the way, the NHL isn't running right now. Yeah, you get one season and then we'll see you in three years. Yeah, like. that's a grand opening and then your store closes for renovations for six months unexpectedly, right? Like yeah. you don't want that. Um, that being said, I think it's less of a risk with Seattle than say if it was Vegas because Seattle has is a much more traditional hockey market than Vegas was. Um, but with the resounding su- success that Vegas was, the league does not want to miss out on um, Seattle money. Uh, another point with the players that they brought up was they don't see the expansion money that doesn't go to them. The league's counter to that is, well, we just created like 43 permanent roster spots with these two expansion teams. So that's huge for the players. And that's a fair point. You created more jobs, but they didn't see the, what is it? Over a billion dollars in expansion money. Yeah. Cause well, again, if you just want to do basic math, well, how much money will this drive to the players well assuming both teams are cap teams like they spend right to the cap sake of simple math let's say the cap goes up to 90 million soon with all the new money coming in cool the players are now getting allocated 180 million extra dollars because that's how much will be going to the players that does not equal a billion no um it's it's complicated the question that i am asking as a hockey fan but i maybe am scared to ask myself or you brad is If it comes down to it and the players have an option to prioritize escrow, so their money, or the Olympics, they're going to select their money, right? A hundred and ten percent. There's a very... I'm not trying to fear monger. I'm not trying to say this is likely, but depending on how aggressive or how you know nasty these negotiations get, and we've seen them get nasty, there's a very real chance that we see the Olympics go by the wayside here because the... NHL understands how big of a bargaining chip that is with the fans and they will use that to leverage a lot out of the players and there might be a point where Donald Fair, the the head of the NHL Players Association, says guys, the sentiment is nice, it's good for the fans, but we have to look out for our employees, which is you. Your financial interests have to be countered here. We have to drop the Olympics thing. So, as fans, as as a fan, you know, I'm, I'm thinking emotionally here, that's one thing that I'm worried about, but it's a very fluid situation. Not to be too too doom and gloom. This is the first time we've had this much optimism. It's worth noting that every report that's come out about the CBA negotiations so far has been positive. Yeah. Now, this is all relative. 
comparative to the last couple. Mm -hmm. So, which is like saying which of the three fires burn down the least. Yeah. But it's still a positive. We have to take it as a positive. I'm a pessimist by nature, so I'm going to assume this is going to go sideways until it doesn't. <laughs> if you're a pessimist by nature, what am I? <laughs> Um, I'm as, I'm honestly essentially like, what's his name? Gilgamesh. Like I'm Satan. If you're a pessimist, like I am just, I am sorrow incarnate. I'm essentially the venom of this podcast. You are the physical embodiment of anxiety. Ah, uh, I'm more like morbid acceptance. Yeah, that's, sure. I don't get anxious a lot. I just kind of laugh and say, ah, if I die, I die. This is true. It actually throws people. I have to stop making that joke. It, it, it's very uncomfortable for people. <laughs> as little, long as you put down the knife, Ryan. I never do it while holding that. Oh, that's actually a very aggressive lie. I did it just the other day with a big <laughs> chef's knife in my hand. <laughs> uh, but only Mel was around. Fair enough. And I didn't point it at her. Yeah. So pessimist by nature, but everything that's been coming out is optimism. Yes. But again, until it's... Anything set in stone, I'm not trusting either of these parties because you can talk about owners or players as they are as people. It doesn't matter. These are two businesses competing for money. Yeah. And that is always the powder keg ready to blow. And it just takes one spark, one thing. I know the one, which agent was it? Alan Walsh mm -hmm. was on Twitter just putting the league on blast. As uh, he does. As, which isn't uncommon for him, but it was even seemed to touch aggressive for him. Um, I haven't seen too much outside of him on the very, yeah. So he's not exactly a good indicator for like overall consensus feelings. He's always going to be on that one side of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, usually you see a little bit more gamesmanship, a little bit more playing of the media at this point from the players association and the league. There have been a couple articles. Who was it on, on Boston? Was it Krejci? Or no, maybe it was someone on San Jose. Vlasic. It was yes, Vlasic Mark Edward Jose. Vlasic kind yeah. of put everybody on notice that the players, that some of the players weren't happy. Yes. Uh, he was the biggest one about it. He hates escrow. Yeah. Um, and that was interesting. And he said, he's like, I understand. I'm not as hurt by this because I'm, I've been, I'll am i be in the league after. I've been in the league a long time before this. I'm secure financially. He's like, I know the guys who are making like 750000 don't love this because they're not secure. He's like, but at the some time, at some point, the players have to stand up for themselves. So I think that was still a very heavy hit. Like he, they found someone on the very aggressive side of that spectrum. But he's no small player. He's no small voice in this process. Um, if there's at least some kind of a sentiment from bigger players and bigger contracts saying this, then it's definitely not going to be easy breezy. We're on very delicate ground right now. Yeah. <laughs>